This video is going to be an overview of neurotransmitters used in the human body. Uh, this is just generally going to be an introduction to neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that transmit information across the body. We're going to be talking about the functions of these neurotransmitters, how they relate to clinical diseases and, uh, and, and some symptoms, and the receptors that these neurotransmitters can, can, can activate, can stimulate, or inhibit. And we have first here on the, on the right, this image of a synapse. And we can see the role of the neurotransmitters located inside those vesicles. That's the neurotransmitter right there. And that's just kind of a general picture of how a neurotransmitter might be released from an axon and hit a receptor. The neurotransmitters that we're going to be talking about are listed on the left here. And we can kind of break these up into categories. So we first have the monoamines. Monoamines are made up of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Dopamine and norepinephrine can further be broken down into the catecholamines. So dopamine and norepinephrine are catecholamines and monoamines. Glutamate, GABA, and glycine are all amino acids, and acetylcholine kind of stands in a class on its own. And we're going to go more in depth into each of these, but it's kind of helpful to, to, to know these categories, and it might help you remember their structure. And although we won't talk about it here, it might help you remember how these neurotransmitters are synthesized. So let's jump right into acetylcholine first, often abbreviated ACH. And we see the, the, the structural formula right there, the, the structure of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is found in a lot of places. First, in the motor neurons, meaning that we see it at the neuromuscular junction. It's found in the brain, specifically in the basal ganglia in the brain, as well as the nucleus basalis of Maynert. It's used in the autonomic nervous system, and specifically in the ganglions of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as the ganglions and the final end cell product of the parasympathetic nervous system. So acetylcholine is used at, as the postsynaptic neurotransmitter, or as, in, as the neurotransmitter in the ganglion for both sympathetic and parasympathetic, and it's also used at the postsynaptic neuron in the parasympathetic. Acetylcholine is used to treat Alzheimer's disease and dementia, two diseases that are associated with memory. And the receptors for acetylcholine are nicotinic receptors, which are ionotropic and excitatory, and muscarinic receptors, which are metabotropic and excitatory or inhibitory. Now let's talk about what's, what, what these words here mean. Ionotropic is a receptor that is activated by a ligand and directly opens a channel. It's essentially a channel that a, a ligand-induced ion channel is ionotropic. Metabotropic, on the other hand, is kind of an indirect way of activating an ion channel. It usually goes through an enzyme cascade, sometimes with second messengers, but you can think of it as an indirect ion channel activation. The two acetylcholine receptors that are important to know are nicotinic and muscarinic. Serotonin, abbreviated 5-TH, uh, based, based on its chemical name, and you can see the structure of it there. Serotonin is found in the brain and brainstem, specifically in the pineal gland and the RAFE nuclei. RAFE or RAF, uh, either pronunciation works. And the RAF is found in the pons, which is a section of the brainstem. Serotonin is involved in limbic function, which regulates emotions, mood, hunger, sex, and instincts, and temperature, and also sleep. So serotonin, as you might guess, uh, just from from knowing about drugs, knowing about SSRIs, is used to treat depression and sleep regulation. It makes sense if it's involved in limbic function, it might be used to treat sleep regulation. And if you know of anybody that takes antidepressants, one major class of antidepressants are SSRIs, which are involved with the reuptake of serotonin. And that's a treatment for depression. The receptors for serotonin are based on this 5-HT abbreviation. So the ionotropic receptor is 5-HT sub 3, which is an excitatory receptor. The metabotropic receptors are the other 5-HT receptors. So 5-HT 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So I kind of just abbreviated that as 5-HT 1 through 7. And these can be either excitatory or inhibitory. So this is serotonin. 
Next, we have dopamine. Dopamine is found in the brain and the brainstem again. Specifically, it's found in the substantia nigra, which is a, a section of the brain that's associated with reward, addiction, and movement. It's also found in the hypothalamus. Dopamine is used in the treatment of two drugs or two diseases, and two diseases specifically have an imbalance of dopamine. This is schizophrenia and Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease is associated with an absence of dopamine, and schizophrenia is associated with a person who has too much dopamine. So one of the treatments for Parkinson's disease is supplemental dopamine, and one of the common effects of taking too much Parkinson's disease medication is psychosis or schizophrenia. So there's kind of a kind of a balance of dopamine that's just right in the body. If it's wrong on one side, if you have too little dopamine, you might end up with symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. If you have too much dopamine, it could cause schizophrenia or psychosis. The receptors for dopamine, easy enough to remember, they're both metabotropic. There are no ionotropic receptors. And the two receptors are D1 and D2. D1 is excitatory, D2 is inhibitory. Norepinephrine is next, another catecholamine. Norepinephrine is found in the brain, specifically in the locus cerulis. It projects to the cortex associ associated with arousal, attention, and anxiety. It's also found in the, in the autonomic nervous system, specifically as the final product in the postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system. Norepinephrine is used in the treatment of ADHD, and this sounds kind of counterintuitive. Norepinephrine is a stimulant um, used to treat a disease that, that, that one might associate uh, with, with overstimulation, but it actually helps to regulate focus and attention in ADHD. It's also helpful in anxiety and cardiac failure. And the cardiac failure is pretty easy to remember. Um, in the hospital, when someone's, someone's, uh, someone's heart stops, you might administer epi, which is a derivative of norepinephrine. And uh, that's, that's usually used for cardiovascular disease. The receptors for norepinephrine are called adrenergic receptors. They are all metabotropic, and there are four of them. Alpha-1 and beta-1 are both excitatory Alpha-2 and beta-2 are both inhibitory. So pretty easy to remember, kind of like dopamine, the ones are excitatory, the twos are inhibitory. Um, in this case, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, uh, beta-2 are all metabotropic. Next we have glutamate, which is an amino acid. Glutamate is easy to remember everything about glutamate. It's found everywhere in the central nervous system. It excites everything. Glutamate is known as the exciter. And it, in fact, it, it excites so much that uh, there's a phenomenon called excitotoxicity, where the neurons can be damaged or killed uh, by overexcitation, sometimes with glutamate. Glutamate is used to treat ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, where it excites motor, sensory, and cognitive neurons as treatment. The receptors for glutamate, and of course, again, emphasizing that they're all excitatory, are NMDA receptor, the AMPA receptor, and the kinate receptor. These are all ionotropic. We also have a couple of metabotropic receptors for glutamate. And I didn't mean to skip so far, but the metabotropic receptors for glutamate follow the GS and the GQ metabolic pathways. You can look those up, GS and GQ, uh, which are stimulatory as well, excitatory, um, and, and they're probably important to know for glutamate. Next we have GABA, and I wrote the full name of the molecule out there. Nobody ever calls it that. It's called GABA. GABA is the universal inhibitor, also found everywhere in the central nervous system. So glutamate is our universal exciter. GABA is the universal inhibitor. Predominantly found in interneurons. That's pretty important to note. GABA is used to treat anxiety and rehab for drug abuse, where it inhibits everything. So again, I'm emphasizing that GABA inhibits everything, whereas glutamate excites everything. The receptors for GABA, again, they're all inhibitory, are GABA-A and GABA-B. GABA-B is ionotropic, GABA-B is metabotropic. GABA-A specifically opens 
calcium channels, ligand-gated calcium channels, and that has an inhibitory effect. GABA-B specifically decreases cyclic AMP and increases potassium channels, and that has, again, an inhibitory effect. So just one more time, re-emphasizing, glutamate is the universal exciter, GABA is the universal inhibitor. Another inhibitor that's worth knowing is glycine. Glycine is only found in the spinal cord, and it inhibits spinal cord interneurons. Glycine is used in the treatment of spasticity, such as in cerebral palsy. The receptors for glycine, easy to remember, there's only one, it's ionotropic, and it's a calcium channel. So glycine is also inhibitory, like GABA, and unlike glutamate. That's all we have for this introduction to neurotransmitters. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.